Welcome to the Bluffton Bible Cast, where together we dive into this week's Bible reading. Join us as we seek to understand the Word more fully so we can live by it more faithfully. Thank you for joining us. I'm Becca Brooks, and I'm here with Darren Dreyer and Chet Bumgarner. Our technical engineer is Jason Gerber. This is the week of October 2nd. And though you're listening to this in October 2nd, we're actually recording it December 15th. So let me just say Merry Christmas. And Darren, I think we should lead a Christmas song the week this podcast comes out. Meanwhile, let's continue to meditate on Jesus' miracles. Okay, so this week's reading begins with the miraculous feeding of the 4,000, which comes after Jesus' feeding of the 5,000. Now, don't some scholars say that they're actually the same event told two different ways? It doesn't make sense to me, but what would you say to that? Yeah, I would say it's a pretty sloppy reading if you're going to assume they're the same. Well, besides the obvious 5,000 versus 4,000, what else is different? Good question. Um, the numbers. So if there are two events that are the same, why are the numbers so different? In the 5,000, they were fed with five loaves and two fish and had 12 baskets of leftovers. In the feeding of the 4,000, they were fed with seven loaves and a few fish and had seven baskets of leftovers. Okay. Anything else? I think the most significant is the location and thus people who witnessed the miracles. People, I'm guessing Jews and Gentiles? Yeah. And the 5,000 took place near Bethsaida. That's a Jewish city. It's actually Peter and Andrew's hometown. And the 4,000 took place in Decapolis. And that's within Jewish lands, but it was mostly inhabited by Hellenistic, or we could say Greek, Gentiles. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So the 4,000 were mostly Gentiles. Okay, that's interesting because the miracle occurred shortly after Jesus cast the demons out of the Canaanite girl, who was a Gentile, right? Yeah. And before the healing of the girl, Jesus told her mother that he was sent, you know, she said, hey, can you heal my daughter? And he said, whoa, I'm sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Interesting. So she asked Jesus then, well, can I at least eat the crumbs from the master's table? But Jesus healed her daughter and then fed the Gentiles much more than crumbs. I mean, he gave them a feast of fish and bread. Yes, the Messiah cares for all people. And so it's interesting then, speaking of caring for the people, before he fed the 4,000, he told his disciples that he has compassion on the people And he doesn't want to send away because they might faint. Ah, compassion on the Gentiles. So do you think Jesus was implying his disciples should have that compassion on them as well? I think that's a really good assumption, and it helps me understand their answer to his question. Uh, What actions? Um, They witnessed the feeding of the 5,000. And then Jesus says, hey, I have compassion on these people. I want to feed them. Then they say, hey, where can we get enough bread? And it makes me think, wouldn't they just anticipate Jesus is going to feed the 5,000, but instead they say, well, we can't get enough bread. Uh, Maybe they didn't want Jesus to feed the Gentiles because they were Gentiles. They're not worthy. Yeah, we don't know for sure, but I think that's a good possibility. Okay, so this is one more example of Jesus being the Messiah to all nations, just as God promised Abraham. Yes, the Messiah to all nations, and that is a good transition because in addition to loving on the Gentiles, the feeding of the 4,000 also helps everyone to see that Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah. How so? Okay, well, let me get political without being political. Oh, boy. So let's say, Chet, let's say you're running for president as a member of the Republican Party. What past president would you attach yourself to? Well, I suppose Ronald Reagan. Yes. And that is exactly what Donald Trump did. We all know his campaign slogan was, Make America Great Again. Wait, that was close to Reagan's? Yeah, Reagan's was, Let's Make America Great Again. Oh. Okay, gotcha. So he was lining himself up as another Reagan. Yes. And just like Jesus was lining himself up as the next Moses, only better. Okay, I see. So Moses feeds the Israelites in the wilderness with manna and quill. Then Jesus feeds the people with bread and fish. Exactly. Ah. And also, remember when the disciples asked where they get enough bread? They actually specifically said, where can we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a multitude? So Jesus here is treating the Jews and the Gentiles the same. Thus, he's breaking down the barrier between Jew and Gentile. So people of Israel, tear down this wall. Okay, though Matthew 16 chronicles no miracles, I believe a handful of particular verses still challenge us to ponder the power Jesus promises, as well as the purpose for that power. So you are referring to the conversation between Jesus and his disciples, in which Jesus famously asked, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Yep. Well, I will admit that I have pondered the verses in this section. And I'm not going to promise to share the definitive interpretation, um, but we can at least try and wrestle with it together. 
Uh, first, I observe that Jesus refers to the church, and he uses a Greek word that the Greek Old Testament, called the Septuagint, uses to refer to the congregation of Israel. So perhaps Jesus said he was essentially establishing a new congregation through a new kingdom, not built on the Mosaic Covenant or proper genealogy or even a particular land, but a proclamation, thou art the Christ. Yeah, and like Darren was saying, as far as him being the Messiah of everyone, King Jesus, or the Anointed One, is the cornerstone of a better worldwide kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And as Jesus tells Peter, and he further explains in Matthew 18, 18, citizens of this kingdom wield the power to loosen and bind. Well, let's pause for a moment. Doesn't that phrasing imply that we have the power to, well, command God? If we want it loosened, he must loosen. Great question. And again, I can't definitively resolve this, but if you study other translations, you'll notice that they translate those verses as whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed. I see. According to this sentence structure, God still has the authority and power. He determines what is bound or loosed, but he'll do it through the church. Still, what specifically does Jesus promise when he promises the power to bind or loose? <sighs> Yet again, another great question. And I've read different interpretations. And again, I encourage people to study this on their own. In Matthew 18, 18 at least, Jesus seems to connect this concept of binding and loosening to church discipline and fellowship, which were two critical components of this new kingdom. You know, ultimately, though, we can just maybe best summarize this promise in this way. God has given the church, those united around Jesus as Savior and Sovereign, the authority to work out his righteousness and will on earth. But if God entrusts us with all that authority, why don't we see more miracles today? It seems like they would really show his power. I don't necessarily think we should assume this promised power manifests itself only, even primarily, through the miraculous. When Jesus gives the church authority, he specifically says the gates of hell or the dominion of death shall not prevail against it. In other words, through Jesus, the church wields power to reconquer the earth and establish the kingdom of heaven. We wield the power of righteousness through the Spirit, who empowers us to live out Jesus' commands. So, and I admit the Bible doesn't explicitly say this, perhaps we can conclude that God manifests the power necessary to show our little corner of the world the superior, superiority of Jesus and his kingdom. Perhaps that power explodes in miracles. Perhaps it explodes in wisdom. Or perhaps it explodes in suffering well, in choosing to sacrifice to honor Jesus' priorities when the world wants us to embrace its lusts instead. And that reminds me of the final verses in Hebrews 11, which list examples of both mighty miracles and tremendous suffering. Yet no matter what, those people were more than conquerors. In both cases, sin and death did not overcome because even in earthly defeat, these believers showed the world that God has a better kingdom promised to those who obey. Now that's power. Amen. But if Jesus builds his church on the proclamation Peter uttered, why did he then tell his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ? Well, I can again only reasonably speculate, but let's quickly review verses 21 through 23. In those verses, Jesus tells his disciples that their Messiah will suffer many things and then die before rising again. Yes, and Peter, well, Peter disagrees. Well, he actually chews Jesus out. Okay, better put. But why? Well, remember that when Peter called Jesus the Christ, he also called him the Son of the Living God. I wonder if Peter pictured the Son of God from Psalm 2, this anointed king who comes to overthrow the nations. And if Peter pictured that kind of Christ... He probably couldn't comprehend a Christ who died at the hands of a foreign nation. Yeah, and so to answer your question, perhaps Jesus didn't want them to preach the wrong kind of Christ. So do you think we too can preach a, well, an incomplete Christ today? I mean, we preach a Jesus who died, and while we say he rose again, we don't fully exalt the kingdom and his power and Jesus' expectations for discipleship or the blessings of such obedience. Yet another good question, and I hope we will all prayerfully ponder that. In Mark 8, verses 22 to 26, we read about people bringing a blind man to Jesus to be healed. This miracle is recorded by Mark alone. In one commentary I read, it mentioned that people say that Jesus' miracles were meant to be attestations of his divine mission. Yes, I'd agree with that. 
Well, this particular commentator mentioned that maybe that wasn't the entire reason. In fact, when some demanded a miracle, he often wouldn't perform it at their bidding. Right, as they were often asking with a scornful attitude or wanting to prove himself. Exactly. This commentator suggested that he wrought his miracles as it was the outcome of his own sympathetic heart brought into contact with human need. Sometimes I think we can view Jesus' purpose here on earth as a time for him to accomplish his Father's will in the plan of salvation, which is true, but we overlook his compassion and kindness in reaching out to the hurting to meet their immediate physical needs. Yeah, I see what you mean. So Jesus takes this blind man by the hand and leads him to a private place to heal him, not truly wanting an audience. And isn't this the healing where Jesus did in two steps? Yes. Jesus spit on the man's eyes and asked him what he saw. The man saw men as trees walking about. And then Jesus put his hands on his eyes again? Yep. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. One commentator likened this to what Jesus does in spiritual conversion. He takes men by the hand and becomes their guide and leader. He brings them by a way that they know not and leads them in paths they had not known before. He makes darkness light before them and crooked things straight and does not forsake them. He takes them apart and separates them from the rest of the world. He calls them out from thence to go with him. Their shining light increases and shines more and more under the perfect day. That is good, but I can't get over the spit. Is there a significance (laughs) to the spit? Fiddle was regarded as a means of cure by the ancients. His putting spit upon the blind man's eyes may signify the means of grace, the eye salve of the word, which, when joined with the power of God, enlightens our eyes. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that the thoughts we shared on this week's reading will spur more contemplation on the works of Jesus while he was on this earth. And Merry Christmas.